In 1787, the founding fathers of our country gathered in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to write the supreme law of the land, the United States Constitution. In it, they defined our government and how it would serve the people. They established three distinct divisions of government, the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch. In this program, we'll take a close look at the makeup and function of one of these three. The legislative branch. In their wisdom, the founders of our country created a system of government that polices itself. Each branch has powers of control over the others. Uh, while if we looked at the Constitution just as words on a page, we might conclude that of the three branches, all of which are supposed to be equal, that is the judicial, the legislative, and the executive, we might conclude that the legislative is the strongest branch because it has the power to structure much of what goes on in the other branches. Their great hope was that the, the central force of democracy would be Congress, that that would be where all the power has lied. But in actual experience, what we've seen, particularly in this century, is the erosion of legislative power in many, many domains. And we've seen the other branches, the executive and the judicial, uh, increase their authority and increase their power to influence the decisions of American life. But what's also important is the bureaucracy, and that the entire bureaucracy, which is technically under the president, which is technically under the executive, carries out the actions of Congress. The legislative branch writes the laws. The judicial branch ensures the laws are not in conflict with the Constitution. And the executive branch carries out the laws. The first and longest article of the Constitution concerns Congress. It defines how it is to be made up and who will serve in this branch of government. Congress is made up of two lawmaking bodies, the House of Representatives and the Senate. The House of Representatives has 435 members, all elected for two years. A representative must have been a citizen for at least seven years and live in the state he or she represents in Congress. A representative must be at least 25 years of age, but the average age of members of the House is 49. The number of seats in the House, 435, is based on the number of congressional districts in the 50 states. Every state is divided up into congressional districts about equal in population. Each district has a representative who is sent to Congress to speak for the people of that district. The term, one man, one vote, is used to describe the requirement that districts be made as nearly equal in population as possible. When Congress was first established back in 1789, there were only 65 representatives from the original 13 states. The number kept increasing along with population growth until early in the 20th century when it reached 435. Every 10 years, a census is taken, an official count of the population of every state. The more people in a state, the more representatives they have in the House of Representatives. But in 1913, Congress decided to keep the number at 435. States with small populations, like Alaska, have only one representative. In this case, the state as a whole is the congressional district and the representative is chosen at large, a term that means elected by the entire population of the state. Speaking of large, Alaska is, ironically, our largest state in area, and yet one of the smallest in population. Only Wyoming has fewer residents. The Senate is made up of 100 senators, two from each state, regardless of population. Big and small states have an equal number of votes in the Senate. The Senate and the House are different creatures. 
Uh, things are very different in the Senate. Uh, there are procedures in the Senate which rely more on unanimous consent uh, of all the members. The, the Senate moves more slowly, typically, uh, and uh, uh, does not uh, operate uh, with the same efficiency that the House operates. A senator is elected for six years, but elections are held every two years. This gives the Senate three layers of experience. Freshman senators who have just been elected, midterm senators who have been in their office for at least two years, and veteran senators. To be elected to the United States Senate, a person must have been a citizen for at least nine years, must live in the state he or she represents, and must be at least 30 years of age. Before 1913, senators were elected by their respective state legislatures, but today, senators are chosen by the people they represent. People of all professions run for elected office, but about half of all congressmen happen to be lawyers. There's no educational requirement to be a congressman, but 75% of our elected officials are college graduates. Getting elected can be very difficult. Well, to uh, be elected as a member of the House of Representatives, you've got to, uh, to win uh, election. Uh, the number of votes that would be required for that will vary from uh, district uh, to district and from election to election. It can take uh, only uh, a few tens of thousands of votes, uh, or it can take more than 100,000 votes. Now, to get those votes, especially in uh, contested elections, fiercely contested elections, where the, a lot of people are going to vote, uh, it can take quite a lot of money. People can spend a million dollars and more uh, on a campaign for a House seat. Running for Congress can be a very expensive uh, proposition. Election Day is always the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November. But the political parties must choose their candidate well in advance of that time. There are several ways in which this is done. One way is to hold a primary election. In a primary, the public votes for the person they want to be their candidate on election day. There can be many people running in the primary, or just two. Another way a candidate can be named is to hold a convention. In this case, members of the political party send delegates to a meeting where they pick their candidate. A third way candidates are chosen is nomination by petition. A candidate must get the signatures of a certain number of voters in order to be placed on the ballot. A new Congress comes together at noon on January 3rd of each odd-numbered year and lasts for two years. The first Congress came together in 1789. They met here, Congress Hall in Philadelphia. Their most important job was naming our first president, George Washington. Each Congress is given a number. As we moved into the 21st century, we have seen over 100 Congresses convene on Capitol Hill. Washington, D.C. was not the first capital of the United States. When George Washington was sworn in as president, New York City was our temporary capital. The seat of government then became Philadelphia for a period of 10 years before it was officially transferred to Washington, D.C. in the year 1800. The United States Capitol is one of the most famous buildings in the world. George Washington laid the cornerstone in 1791, but construction wasn't completed until 1811. A short time later, during the War of 1812, British troops burned it down. It was soon rebuilt, and since then, many additions and improvements have been made to keep pace with the changing times.
The building is designed around a central rotunda. The Senate chambers are on the north side of the building. The House of Representatives meets in the far south side. Down the middle of each chamber runs an aisle. From the front, where the presiding officer sits, the Democrats are on the right and the Republicans are on the left. This division of the parties can be clearly seen during a President's State of the Union address. Members of the President's political party show their appreciation for his leadership. Members of the opposing party are more reserved. Depending on the political climate of the nation, either the Republicans or Democrats will be the dominant party in the House and Senate. The party with the greater number of members is called the majority. The party with fewer members is called the minority. There's the interesting question uh, whether we're better off with divided government, that is saying, uh, that is a situation where the president comes from one party and the Congress comes from another party or is controlled by another party, or whether we're better off with unified government. And I think it's impossible to give a global answer to say that it's always best to have divided government or always best to have unified uh, government. Sometimes divided government impedes anything getting done or impedes important things getting done. So there are times when the stalemate gets so aggravated on both sides that um, members of Congress, whether it's a, an agenda by the Speaker or a, an agenda by the President, that members on both sides will attempt to um, heighten the bar by, by getting ugly. Uh, at other times, divided government has been able to work. People have been forced to compromise. And the policies that have been em emerging from divided government in some occasions policies that have emerged from divided government are policies that really are more in line with the wishes of the American people. There's been a whole series of um, law and economics literature that has established how um, a bicameral legislature is actually more difficult to get things passed through than a single chamber with a supermajority. At the beginning of a Congress, the majority and minority parties each choose leaders. The majority leader in the House is the Speaker of the House. In the Senate, the majority leader is President Pro Tempore. The term means, for the time being. The Vice President of the United States is officially the President of the Senate. Pursuant to United Nations Security Council 678 is passed. However, in practice, the Vice President does not routinely attend meetings of the Senate. In his place, the Senate chooses a President Pro Tem to take his place. The person selected for this position will be a senior member of the majority party. Likewise, in the House, the person chosen as Speaker of the House will be a respected member of the majority party. Selection of the Speaker of the House is very important since he or she is third in line to succeed to the presidency in the event of the death of the president and the vice president. In both the House and Senate, other officials are selected to manage their party's affairs. The term whip is used to refer to majority and minority party members who keep colleagues informed about pending legislation and round them up to vote. Both parties also have steering and policy committees to help the leaders deal with party business. There's another point worth making here, and it is that our founders deliberately arranged our institutions in such a way as to ensure that there would be deliberation. And that's intentionally. That inefficiency built into the system of government was purposely put there. Uh, it wasn't an attempt to move quick. It was an attempt so that legislation, so that actions of the government were done very slowly and methodically. Partisanship uh, shouldn't be something that we simply dismiss as necessarily a bad thing. It's certainly not a new thing. If we go back to the early debates, all the way back to the Constitutional Convention, we see extreme bickering, what people would call extreme partisanship. But what that reflected was a genuine good faith disagreement between people like Alexander Hamilton, who really did believe in a strong central government because that's the way Hamilton thought the country would move ahead, and people like Patrick Henry, for example, who were very fearful of a strong central government and uh, wanted to make sure that the rights of states and localities were protected. So what we sometimes dismiss or, or deride as, as partisanship 
is sometimes just important good faith disputation between people of good will that will result in the end in a better policy for everybody concerned. Making our nation's laws is the primary function of Congress. It also happens to be one of its powers. Only the Congress can make laws which affect the nation's finances. Only Congress can make laws about national defense. Only Congress can declare war against another country. However, Congress cannot make laws which disagree in any way with the Constitution. If they do, the Supreme Court has the power to reject these laws. Now there's another important thing to remember, and that is even in light of this orthodoxy that says the Supreme Court gets the final say on the constitutionality of laws, despite that, when it comes to the Supreme Court's other main power, and that is interpreting laws enacted by Congress, the Supreme Court does not necessarily have the final word. After the Supreme Court has interpreted laws made by Congress, and stated their meaning. If Congress doesn't like the Supreme Court's interpretation, it can go back and amend the laws, change the language, clarify the language to, in effect, reverse Supreme Court decisions. The power of the purse lies at the heart of the authority of Congress. Raising money through taxation and allocating the way money may be spent are the two components of this authority. Financing the government is carried out under a broad mandate of the Constitution with these words. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises, to pay all debts, and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. Furthermore, the Constitution states, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. This provision is one of the legislature's most potent weapons in overseeing the nation's budget. Congress has the power to amend or change the Constitution. While this power is a powerful one, it is extremely difficult to make a change to the Constitution, and very rare. The Constitution itself uh, puts into place procedures for its own amendment. The founders were realistic men. They realized that they were incapable, because all human beings are incapable, of producing a constitution that's perfect and would never need any adjustment or changing. So the founders put into the constitution provisions for its amendment. And there are two ways to do it. One is by way of a constitutional convention. Our own constitution came into being by a constitutional convention. We haven't had a second constitutional convention. That's not to say that we won't someday, but that hasn't been the way we've amended our Constitution. On the 27 occasions when we've amended our Constitution formally, we've used the other procedure set forth in the Constitution. Now, according to that procedure, two-thirds of both houses of Congress, the Senate and the House of Representatives, have to pass a proposed constitutional amendment, and then that proposed constitutional amendment, having passed the Congress by that two-thirds majority in both houses, will go on to the states where three-quarters of the states have to ratify it. And upon ratification, it becomes part of the Constitution. Another power given to Congress is the right to conduct investigations into matters of national importance. Congress is responsible for constantly watching everything the executive branch does. Each committee of Congress keeps in close touch with the executive department or agency that concern it. For example, the Foreign Affairs Committee with the Department of State, and the Armed Service Committee with the Department of Defense. The most famous investigation in recent years was the Watergate affair, which led to the first ever resignation of an American president, Richard M. Nixon. Congress has the power to impeach or remove any civil officer from office, including the President of the United States. To impeach means to charge with a high crime or misdemeanor. The Constitution gives the House the power to start the procedure, but the Senate must vote on the charges, acting as judge and jury. The Senate must find the charges either sufficient or insufficient to remove the person from office. 
Only three presidents in our nation's history faced impeachment. Andrew Johnson in 1868, Richard Nixon in 1974, and most recently, Bill Clinton. Only Richard Nixon was removed from office, but not by the Senate. He took the responsibility upon himself and resigned. I'd love to have talked to you and found out how to run the world. <laughs> Everybody wants to tell the president what to do. And uh, boy, he needs to be told. As head of the executive branch, the president has the power to appoint officers of the United States, but with the Senate's advice and consent. Congress shares its power with the courts. The judiciary has assumed a leading role in interpreting laws and determining their constitutionality. Judicial review involves both interpretation and judgment. First, it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Second, the Supreme Court has the duty of comparing laws with the Constitution and invalidating those that are in conflict with it. Probably the court's one and only strong power is its ability to review the acts of other branches. The court's job is to interpret the Constitution, to, in anything that would violate that, the court's job is to ensure that the Constitution remains the supreme law of the land. A phenomenon that has grown larger and more important to Congress over the years is the work of special interest groups and their lobbyists. The term lobbyist, I think, is derived from the practice of those who were seeking to influence uh, legislators of gathering in the lobby uh, outside the legislative chambers so that they would have access uh, to the members of the legislative body. When America's founders wrote the Constitution in the late 1700s, they wanted the members of Congress to represent the people. But the world has changed since the late 1700s. One critic of the way modern government operates said that today, congressmen do not represent the people, but rather special interests. Not everyone agrees with that view, but most people agree that special interest groups and their lobbyists exercise considerable influence over Congress. The term special interest group uh, is a term that's become familiar in our political discourse. It's often used in a pejorative sense to imply uh, somebody who wants something that they shouldn't be getting or some, somebody who wants something that uh, uh, they want simply for their own selfish reasons. But I think it's important to realize that while there are, of course, people who are interested in politics because of their own selfish ends to advance their own business interests or that sort of thing. There are plenty of people who organize themselves into groups, we might call them special interest groups, uh, who are trying to do the public good. Under our Constitution, uh, all the people have a right to petition the Congress for a redress of grievances. And that's what lobbying is. Actually, lobbyists are probably one of the most informed people uh, on Capitol Hill. They know their information, their information is accurate. Uh, they probably the biggest exchange of ideas goes on between a lobbyist and members of Congress. Um, I mean, yes, they're there to persuade, but they're there to inform as well. Of course, in the history of our country, there have been uh, many uh, significant groups who have lobbied the Congress for fundamental change uh, in the country. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement uh, was a grassroots movement, but it's also a lobbying movement where individuals came to Washington to persuade members of Congress to enact the civil rights laws that we have today. Uh, the movement for women's suffrage uh, was also uh, a movement that lobbied uh, the Congress. And there are countless examples of uh, lobbying efforts that have uh, had a tremendous impact on uh, the uh, politics of the nation. James Madison, the father of the Constitution, said, liberty is to faction what air is to fire. In other words, a free society fuels and nurtures politically active special interest groups. Until recent years, national policymaking was dominated by a few well-organized, well-financed groups. Farm, labor, business, 
veterans, and medical interests. The current era has seen an explosion in the growth and diversity of interest groups, including narrow-based groups that focus on single issues, such as abortion or gun control. Any organized interest in this country uh, is most likely represented here in Washington. American people want to know what Congress is doing. More than 2,500 members of the Capitol Press Corps watch and report. Correspondents from newspapers, magazines, radio, and television regularly attend House and Senate sessions. There are studios next to the House and Senate floor where members of the press can conduct radio and TV interviews. Proceedings of the House have been televised since 1979 on C-SPAN, the cable public affairs network. This is simply going to be how much medical reason is there to believe that this procedure, whoever is supplying it, a private uh, company or not, is, go is going to help whatever's wrong with it. Okay. In 1986, the Senate authorized gavel-to-gavel -gavel television coverage of its proceedings on C-SPAN. A huge array of congressional information is available free at internet sites operated by the federal government. All three branches of government maintain web pages. The most important organizational feature of the House and Senate is the structure of their committees. Early in the 19th century, committees weren't as necessary to the work of Congress but as legislative business became more complex, the division of labor among members became more complex as well. Ultimately, committees and their subcommittees came to provide the focus of most congressional work. Well, as Woodrow Wilson said, Congress in committee is Congress at work. I think Wilson was right, but today uh, it's probably a little more true to say that Congress in subcommittee is Congress at work because it is in the subcommittees that the hearings are held where extensive consideration is given to various issues and legislative proposals. And the real studying of issues uh, takes place. Uh, this is where members roll up their sleeve and, and really work on the actual writing of a, a piece of legislation. The, this is where the hearings are held. This is where information is gathered and, and the result is actually a bill. I am chairman of the Constitution Subcommittee of the House Judiciary Committee. I also serve on various other uh, subcommittees of the Judiciary Committee as well as on uh, a subcommittee of the House Agriculture Committee. Uh, it's in those uh, subcommittees that I spend the bulk of uh, my time here as a member of Congress. And that's where the bulk of my effort is directed. The House and Senate each have a committee to recommend committee assignments. Each representative serves on at least one committee, most on two or three. Each senator serves on at least two committees, some on five or six. Usually the number of majority and minority members on a committee will reflect the ratio of majority to minority in the House and Senate as a whole. Each committee has a chairman or chairwoman. The majority party elects whomever it wants, but usually a senior member is chosen. Heads of committees have a great deal of influence and power. There are now 22 standing or permanent committees in the House and 17 in the Senate. Well, most of the committees that are in the Congress are referred to as standing committees. Those are the committees that uh, continue from Congress to Congress uh, who uh, do the, uh, the work uh, legislatively of considering uh, legislation uh, that will ultimately be considered on the floor. In addition, there are select committees, joint committees, and conference committees. Select committees are uh, committees that are formed for either a limited time or for a particular purpose. Uh, typically, they do not have legislative jurisdiction. That is, they cannot act on legislation and then uh, move it to the floor of the House. That, that sets them apart from standing committees. Uh, joint committees are committees that are composed of members of both the House and Senate to consider uh, issues of, uh, of special interest to both bodies. The preeminent example of a joint committee is the Joint Economic Committee, which considers uh, economic issues uh, that are important to both the House and Senate. 
Um, more recently, and this is kind of an interesting uh, point, work happens in committees not directly before the bill is passed on the floor, but after in conference committee. Conference committees play a, a critical role in the legislative work of the Congress because conference committees have the responsibility of working out the differences between legislation that's been passed by the House and legislation passed by the Senate. The House and Senate version must pass exactly the same, down to commas, every, it, it has to be exactly the same version sent to the President. Conference committee appointees almost always happen from the committee that had original oversight, so that the conference appointees, the conference managers, come from the original committee. So usually there is a joint committee or a conference committee in which members from both of the standing committees in the House and Senate will meet and work out the details of a piece of legislation. Once they're finished, it goes back to both chambers, again voted on, agreed upon, and then it's sent to the White House for signature. Some of the most powerful committees of Congress are those that hold the government's purse strings. Both houses have committees that govern taxation and government spending. Because budgetary power is the most formidable of congressional powers, these committees exercise great influence. The most important function of Congress is to make laws. The process begins when a bill is introduced by a member of either the House or Senate. To have a bill become a law, it first has to be introduced. Sometimes members of Congress will introduce uh, legislation uh, simply to let uh, certain groups know that they support a particular position. Uh, it's shown, it's a way to show a support uh, for a particular proposal, even though the member will know that the legislation is dead on arrival, it's never going anywhere. Typically what will happen is a bill is, sent, is put in the hopper by a particular member of Cong uh, Congress in the House. Oftentimes members find someone to introduce it in the other chamber as well. Of course, ideas for legislation can come from a variety of different sources. Uh, it's not unusual for a member to uh, introduce a bill at the request of uh, the uh, administration. Uh, if a particular uh, agency of the government uh, has a proposal that they wish to have considered. Members also introduce legislation at the suggestion of outside interest groups. Or sometimes members just have an idea of their own that they put in legislative form and introduce. Uh, a number of members can sign on and introduce a bill together, which, by the way, has cut down on the number of bills introduced since that rule has been allowed. The way the system is organized in the Congress today, members place their names on legislation as co-sponsors. So it's not at all unusual to have a single piece of legislation that would have uh, 200 members with their names on it. And joining as a co-sponsor is a way of expressing uh, complete support for the legislation in question. And bills are introduced. They're almost always first assigned to a committee. Uh, then once a bill is, gone to, is assigned to a particular committee, then that committee assigns it to the relevant subcommittee. Uh, the committees carefully study issues. Hearings are held. And then the committees also carefully consider legislation through extensive markup sessions where amendments are offered uh, to the bills under consideration and debate is heard uh, and legislation is refined and hopefully improved. Uh, from a subcommittee, it will go back to the full committee for a vote. Uh, in the House, it will go to the Rules Committee, which will set the, the parameters of floor debate for a rule, for a bill. The House and the Senate do have different procedures for bringing legislation to the floor. Uh, in the House, the Rules Committee plays a role there uh, in structuring uh, floor consideration for legislation. In the Senate, the steps are virtually the same, except there is no Rules Committee. The Senate, by tradition and custom, allows unlimited debate. When legislation comes to the floor of the House or Senate uh, for floor action, Members of the House and Senate then have the opportunity uh, in their respective chambers uh, to debate uh, the legislation under consideration, uh, to offer uh, amendments uh, to that uh, legislation, uh, and then ultimately to vote on whether the legislation shall be passed or not passed. It's frequently be the case in the House that in debate uh, an individual member might have no more than a minute 
uh, to speak, if the member has even that amount of time. Uh, and in the Senate, the members may go on uh, for lengthy periods of time. So usually there is a joint committee or a conference committee in which members from both of the standing committees in the House and Senate will meet and work out the details of a piece of legislation. Once they're finished, it goes back to both chambers, again voted on, agreed upon, and then it's sent to the White House for signature. Before a vote can be taken, there must be a quorum in each chamber. A quorum is one more than half. In the Senate, 51 senators is a quorum. And in the House, it's 218 representatives. The Senate do use different methods for recording the votes of, mem of members. Uh, in the Senate, uh, the roll is called. and. Members of the Senate respond when their name is called by saying uh, yay or nay. Uh, in the House, we have an electronic voting device uh, that allows members uh, to record their votes uh, by inserting their voting card into a device and pushing uh, a button uh, to indicate yes, no, or present. A bill passed by a majority vote of the members of the House and Senate is finally sent to the president for approval. If the president signs the bill, it becomes law. However, the president may veto the bill, sending it back to Congress unsigned, along with the president's objections. Under our Constitution, uh, the legislative process involves not just the House and Senate, but also the president, because the president has the right to veto legislation that does not meet his approval. And if the president uh, vetoes a particular bill, it can only be enacted into law if two-thirds of the members of both the House and Senate subsequently vote to override the president's veto. It's interesting to look at statistically when override provisions uh, become more prominent, usually at the end of a president's term when they're a lame duck, so to speak, uh, when they have been politically scarred Nixon, when Watergate becomes so difficult for him, finds that the ability to be overridden is enormous. The War Powers Resolution, the Ethics and Government Act, which creates um, a number of provisions for investigating the ex executive branch, all pass over Nixon's veto. Among the legislatures of the world, Congress is unique in being served by a large staff. More than 7,500 staff employees work for the House members and more than 3,600 for senators. House and Senate committees also employ more than 3,000 staff personnel. In addition, Congress receives the search and information services from major agencies. The Congressional Research Service, an arm of the Library of Congress, provides wide-ranging research services for members of Congress and committees. These and several other support agencies serve the legislature. Altogether, more than 23,000 staff employees work for Congress. The work of the federal government is huge. It takes a lot of people to get the work done, and the work is done slowly, methodically, and carefully. The interaction of the three branches of our government is unique. Our system of checks and balances keeps each branch operating within its prescribed boundaries of authority, and each make a strong contribution to our democratic system of liberty and justice for all. <laughs>